Hello, I'm Nathan Furr from the Rollins Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology at Brigham Young University. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Today we'll be hearing from Clint Argyle of Prime Alliance Bank. At the age of 21, Clint, Clint started and ran a garbage business that paid for his education at UVSC and BYU. He also worked as a software salesman at the same time to get health insurance and business experience while in business school. While working as a salesman, Clint recognized an opportunity to start a data collection business inside of his current company, which he started and then later sold to the company he was working for. After graduating from BYU in 1991, Clint sold his garbage business for one time's revenue and used the proceeds to, to start Keystone Learning Systems. In 1999, he and his partner sold the company to Global Learning Systems. Clint then ran the company for two years as president. In 2003, Clint and a partner decided to get into the community banking business and started a community bank called Prime Alliance Bank. Clint is on the board, several committees, and is a shareholder. Clint and his wife Sherry have been married for 20 years and have four children. They live in Spanish Fork, Utah. The Marriott School of Management welcomes Clint Argyle to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. It's thank great you. to be here. Now, thank you, Clint, for coming. You've got a fascinating and you know very entrepreneurial background, so we're really looking forward to talking to you today. And you know, the, really, the purpose of this lecture series is to reach out to all BYU students and all members of the church. And so, really, we want to do whatever we can to extract the general principles of your experience and share those with everybody. And to do that, I think the best format would to be hear a little bit about yourself hear a little bit about what you're doing right now, and then we can kind of step back and you know, talk about entrepreneurship in general. So maybe tell us more about yourself. I mean, you've got a fascinating background. How did you get into entrepreneurship? Why and why did you keep going? Just you know, tell us about it. Well, it's kind of fun. I'm glad you asked that. My background is I'm a country boy from a little community called Lakeshore, Utah, and I grew up working in the farms there and learning how to work, and I'm grateful for those in my life that taught me how to work. That was one of the things that really helped me in my career as an entrepreneur is I wasn't afraid to just jump in and try things and make it happen. So I really appreciate that. It was a great experience growing up that way. And I've always had a job since I was about 10, so I, I've had a few years of working. Yeah. And I was grateful for, since we're in the BYU realm, I can say a mission because I went on my mission and it helped me realize more about what I want to do for a career. When I got home from my mission, I had learned how to talk to people, I learned how to knock on doors, and, and that didn't scare me. That's how I got into the garbage business. At 21, I came home from my mission with Dad. I really like to be able to do something besides working a fast food joint and try to get through college. He says, well, I have an idea for you. I said, what's that? And he says, haul garbage. I said, wow, okay, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, yeah. kind of like when you were a kid, Boy Scouts, hauling garbage down here in the county. And so I then started knocking on doors, asking people if they'd like me to haul their garbage, and enough people said yes, and that's how I got my first business going. Wow, fascinating. You know, it's interesting you kind of highlight the fact that you came from this little Utah town. But what do you take away from that experience? I mean, to me it kind of says you don't have to have some fancy education to start, you know, something. You know, you got to have desire. I mean, what, what, do you, what does that mean for you? It, it means to me is you do have to have desire. You have to have a passion for excellence. That's another thing you really have to have. And um, just a go get it attitude. And um, my opinion in businesses is you have to just be willing to go try things, even when you're facing huge challenges, and even when you have people tell you you can't do it. Um, I've had many people tell me, Clint, you can't do it. And especially on the bank, we'll talk about that yeah. later. But I was surprised at how many people discouraged me from getting in the banking industry. Yeah, fascinating. And I mean, in a way, I mean, garbage is, you know, not necessarily the most exciting industry to get into, <laughs> but obviously a you know, real opportunity. And then from there, you, you were doing business, you were doing sales, technical sales, was that right? Uh -huh. or, and you started a company within a company. Tell me more about that. Well, I was just a little bit entrepreneurial. As I was selling software, I mm -hmm. saw this opportunity in this business. There was a niche that wasn't being filled. And, I went to my boss and I said, hey, I think there's a really good opportunity for our company to get into this niche business. And he says, ah, it's out of our core competency. I, I don't think we ought to do it. And I said, well, as a salesman, I need this thing that we're missing here. And so let me have a whirl at it. And he says, well, you go ahead and buy the computer and the equipment you need and go ahead and do it. And you can do it inside of our business. And 
So I did it, I got it running, I showed it would work, and he realized that, oh yeah, something we really need to have as part of what we're doing, and so he says, well, I'll buy it back from you. So he ended up buying the equipment back, he gave me a little bit of a you know, profit on it, and it yeah. turned out good, so. That's great, <laughs> way to go. And, um, you know, it, it is nice from the ethical standpoint that you told them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's important too. And then after that, you started another business. You started, tell me about that. Well, that one was Keystone Learning Systems, and again, the, the, the neat thing was is I was in the high-tech industry and I was in software, so I could see opportunities coming. And there was a big need for people to learn how to use Microsoft Windows, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel. And this was back in the early 90s when Microsoft wasn't the player. It was Novell and WordPerfect and Lotus. And so anyway, I started seeing this opportunity and I talked to a guy and said, hey, can you build videos? And he said, yeah, I can build them. And I said, I think I can sell them. And I see there's a big opportunity. And so we started a company called Keystone Learning Systems. Mm -hmm. and, and we started it with the money we had. He had the video equipment and I had sold the garbage business when I graduated. So I had some money to get started with. So he brought the equipment, I brought the cash and we started producing our videos. And we started with two Windows videos on how to use Windows, I think it was like version 3.1, <laughs> and Word 2.0 and Excel 4.0 or something yeah. like that. And we had six videos that we started with. Um, we started um, filming those in our basements. That's where we were living, our apartment basement. We, that was our first set. Yeah. And <laughs> we made our first products and started selling them then. It was kind of a bootstrap deal. Wow, that's fascinating. Now you said something interesting. You're in the tech industry, so you're able to recognize opportunities coming down. How how did you recognize these opportunities? Well, I was selling software, yeah. and I was selling software from Utah, but most of our customers were in Chicago and New York and L.A. and San Francisco, and I was trying to teach them how to use our software. Our techs were trying to teach them how to use the software over the phone. We didn't have the mm, technology we yeah. have now to do it. Yeah. And I kept thinking, we can fly people out to train our customers, we can fly them here, and we tried that. We tried flying them to Utah and training them, and then they had to close their positions and their it was um, technical training software. Yeah. So anyway, just the training part wasn't working. I thought, hey, we can just put our best trainers on video, yeah. and then we can ship it anywhere in the world. And yeah. that's actually what we end up doing. We end up having customers in almost every country that had computers back then. It was way neat. Wow, that's fascinating. You recognize a real pain point, basically. Yeah, people need to learn. Yeah, and, and I also think it's important that sometimes you have to be kind of in the game to see what where the pain is. So, it does um, help. <laughs> that, yeah, it does help. So then, so, so then you you know you ran Keystone for a while. You you're president. You exited, and then you started Prime Alliance Bank. Tell me more about that. How? Yes. Yeah, I, well, I've been as you it. noticed, I've been to a few industries. Yeah. Um, Jack of many industries, master of none. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do like change and variety. That's yeah. one thing about my personality. And so I was trying to decide what my next um, business venture was going to be. And I had one in between there that I didn't tell you about actually. Okay. Yeah. And some of the guys from Keystone, after we merged, it wasn't what they wanted and they wanted to start their own business. And I helped them and tried to get something going and that didn't work out. That was one of my um, failures. Yeah. So I don't want anybody to think that I've never failed at business. Okay. I have had a failure. It was a big failure, and we won't talk about the numbers here on, yeah. on TV, but yeah. it was a failure. And so after that one, I was talking with a financial advisor of mine that's yeah. had multiple companies. They said, here, what do you think of this idea? What do you think of this idea? And I was just kind of bounce ideas off of him. And then one day I thought, you know, I really should ask him if he was going to start another company or yeah. buy a company because he had done several too. I was like, what would it be? And as soon as I asked him, he said, well, it'd be a bank or a factoring company. And I went, wow, really? Okay, well, I don't know much about factoring, but I've been involved with banks my whole life, so tell me about banking, and so we started looking into the possibilities and how would it work, and we decided to try getting into community banking. Wow, that's cool. Now, I have to take a step back to the failure, if you don't mind, because oh. I, I think that's really important. <laughs> and what, what was the business, if, you don't, if we can talk about it? We don't have to talk about the numbers, but what was it you were trying to do? Well, what we were trying to do is get into the IT industry that we had come from mm -hmm. in a little bit of different way. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't work out. The industry that we were, the little sector we were trying to get into, mm -hmm. it just wasn't the business model that we thought it would be. And then we tried to shift it to a different industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that industry found out wasn't big enough to mm -hmm. really support the business model that we put together. So we actually switched from the high-tech industry into scrapbooking and genealogy. Yeah. Wow. and doing self-paced training in there. It was, and 
we made sales, we everything else, so the business worked, but it wasn't big enough. That's one of the things I want to talk about is if you start a business, make sure the industry is big enough and that there's enough customers and the customers are looking for a solution and we'll pay you for your goods and services. Okay. So okay, that's, a lot of lessons learned. Yeah, and, and then you just, you know, pulled the plug and that's sometimes what you gotta do. Sometimes so. you do. When the pain gets high enough you just say, Nope, I've put enough in and it's not working and yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Move on to the next fun thing, which was the bank. That's true. It made room for the bank. <laughs> and um, so tell us a little bit more about, you know, since you're in the banking industry right now, just kind of what are some, how does, how does in a way this is a silly question to ask at this time, you know, banking industry is tough. But tell yeah. us more about your specific space within the banking industry. What's that industry like? You know, where are you, what, what part of the whole banking sector are you? Well, we are in a niche part of that. We're into business, business banking. We okay. mostly work with businesses who uh -huh. need SBA loans. We uh -huh. also work with businesses who are in the um, real estate realm. And right now, that's not a great place to be. But on the other hand, long term, I think real estate's a wonderful investment. And we're also into equipment leasing for businesses mm -hmm. that need equipment. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very diverse portfolio. Mm -hmm. We have customers all over Utah on the real estate side and the SBA side. We have customers actually nationally with our um, leasing so yeah it's really it's fun it's yeah neat. wow I, I if we have time I'd love to cover more about you know how you actually do that where do you get the capital etc but it's clear <laughs> it's clear you've had a number of experiences and we should really jump into you know what would you say what are your rules for entrepreneurship rules for entrepreneurship oh boy there's quite a few rules and I'm sure you're hearing about them in different places but yeah. some of the rules for me are that you need to ask yourself, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Because a lot of entrepreneurs think the first thing you got to do is go borrow money from venture capitalists or someone else. And as soon as you do that, you lose the opportunity as an entrepreneur to be the boss, the, the guy, the one that owns it and controls and gets to do everything. And so you have to ask yourself, why are you in business? I, I got into business because I wanted to provide a living for my family. I knew I had opportunity to make money in business. I, one of the things I look at when I was looking at careers is if doctors and lawyers do good and it seemed like the business people had an opportunity to do well and I knew I didn't want to be a doctor or lawyer so <laughs> business made, yeah. uh, made sense but I, it was a way I could make some money take care of my family and then also I like to I guess maybe a little bit of a control freak I'm the oldest of four mm -hmm. in my family and I like control and I like to be able to feel like I have some control of my destiny and so those are the reasons I got into business so I would suggest one of the rules is make sure that you look at what you're interested in and why would you want to get in business and then another rule for me is I gotta have passion about it. I gotta be excited about it. I gotta be able to get up in the morning and say, I'm excited to go to work today. Yeah. I mean, isn't that cool, Nathan? You just yeah. get up and you go, I love work. Yeah. And it's not like, oh man, I gotta go to work again today. <laughs> I'm dreading my boss. I'm dreading yeah. the place. Yeah. yeah. I don't. That, that's terrible to me. So one of the rules is just have some passion for it. Be excited about it. Have have a love for what you do. So those are some of the rules. Do you want me to cover more? Or? Yeah. Well, tell us. But first, I want to say one more thing, and that is. How do you know what your passion is? How do you figure that out? That's a tough one. <laughs> How did you figure it out? Uh, I guess I could say I was lucky, but <laughs> yeah, lucky. Just I just watched for it. I watched, yeah. observed. I, I actually ask people. I say, "What do you notice that I seem to have some skills for? Uh -huh. What have you noticed about me that seems to be some of my talents that I have?" Mm -hmm. um, I believe all of us are given some God-given talents, and then also we learn some talents as we go through life, and so. Start observing and being aware of what do I really love? What gets me excited? I mean, I love Keystone Learning Systems because I was helping people get educated. And at that time, people might be making $30,000 a year. They could get some certification or some training and jump to 40000 a year, maybe even fifty or sixty. Some of our programmers, boy, they'd learn how to program in Visual Basic, and they could really take a big pay jump. Mm -hmm. and it was just exciting to see these people improve their lives and do better. And so yeah. that got me excited. It was something I really liked. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was making good money. And so I just, this is a win-win for everybody. I really like what I'm doing. People are making money. And so I think you need to observe it. That's good. No, that's good. I mean, I'm noticing kind of one of your key themes here, which is, you know, you've said you need to really want to do it and be passionate about it. Mm -hmm. But really underneath that, you know, kind of principle number one is know yourself, you know. Know what it is you want. Know what it is you're good at. You know, you, you made this point about watching for, you know, the things that you're good at, watching for the skills you've added, asking other people, like, what have you seen that I'm good at? What, what, what are my skills? And then finding a match of that with what gets you excited to go and do. And then you have to say, are you the kind of, I mean, you're obviously the kind of person who wants to get up and, you know, forge his own destiny. 
Some folks don't want to do that. They yeah. want to, you know, be told what to do, and that's okay. We're all yeah. made differently. Yeah, you, right. you know, match the person with, with the situation. So that's good. I'm glad you brought up the ask thing. I yeah. want to encourage people that are watching this. Don't be shy. Be willing to ask other people how they do things. Mm. Some of the best ideas I've ever gotten is going and asking other business people how they do things, what's important to them. I went and talked to a C-store, a convenience store owner once, that was real successful in my community, and I said, how do you deal with competition? He says, how I deal with competition is I don't worry about competition. And I go, yeah, be kidding me. There's tons of C stores in our area. How can you not worry about competition? He goes, because I'm more worried about my customers mm -hmm. and what my customers need and what I need to deliver to them so they keep coming to my store instead of somebody else's. So he says, I focus on my customers, not my competition. I thought, that's insightful because you only have so much time yeah. and work on what can I do best to take care of my customers and long term. And that was probably 15 years ago I talked to him, and he's still doing great and successful. And so that was a little thing I learned from asking and not being shy and thinking, somebody's going to think I'm stupid because I asked a question. They don't think that way. Business people are successful because other people have helped them be successful, mm -hmm. and they're willing to help others because others have helped them. It's kind of that giving back mm -hmm. to those who have helped you, and it's a great thing. You know, it's interesting. It's one of the qualities of Sam Walton, you know, founder of Walmart, that he used to do. He would just ask incessant questions, whether it was of customers or friends or even competitors. He would go in with like a notepad to a store and he would just take notes. Just, well, how do you do this? And why do you keep that there? And how do you stock this? And just constantly asking questions. And asking questions can be a real shortcut. It is. It's a great way to learn. <laughs> okay. So what are some of your other rules of entrepreneurship? Ah, some of the rules are is to find a need and fill it. There really has to be a need in the industry. I've had lots of ideas but ideas are quite a bit different than needs. So you need to be looking, is there a need out there? I think you mentioned pain, is there, mm -hmm. is there a pain point? Um, customers have this need, and can I go out there and I, can I fill that need? That, so that's a, that's a big one. And then again, is, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is the market big enough? If there is a need, well, if it's only $5,000 a month need, that's your gross revenue, that's going to be hard to make a living out of that if that's how narrow the need is. So you got to make sure it's a, a big enough market out there. And then how can I compete in that market? You got to be able to make sure that, oh, if I get into this industry, I'm going to be able to add value and be able to compete out there in delivering my goods or services. Those are, that's a few of the ones. The other one is, is build a good team. You can only do so much as an entrepreneur, and that's the one where you got to be a jack of all trades, master of none, starting out. You got to wear multiple hats. You're a marketer one minute, you're a salesperson the next minute, the next minute you're paying the bills. You know, you're changing these hats all the time as you're an entrepreneur getting something started if you're starting from scratch. And so you do that, but then you also need to be able to say, okay, when I hire someone, I need to hire the right person for my team. And usually that right person isn't somebody like you, okay? A lot of times people want to hire somebody like them because they get along, we have common interests and that kind of thing. But then you're sitting there fighting over who gets to do the fun stuff because you're so much alike. Well, I want to do marketing. No, I want to do marketing. I want to do sales. No, I want to do sales. Well, okay, if you do that, who's going to do the finances and work with the suppliers and all that stuff? And so you want to hire the right people that fit where you need them at that particular time in your business growth. And then hire people that are the right ones for you as far as do they fit the culture that I have. And that's another really cool thing about being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. that I love. Mm -hmm. You get to create the culture of your business, and that is fun. This is how we're going to be. We're going to be family-oriented. We're going to go to work in... Button-down shirts. We're not wearing any other uniforms. Yeah. What, we're, no ties in our culture. Nothing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You get to decide the culture, or it can be we're going to have a suit. We're going to have an image. We're going to look like this, and everybody sees us this way. And that's what's cool. So culture is a big thing that I think you need to think about as you're building your business. What's our culture going to be like? Yeah. And if you're going to be willing to hire someone, remember you got to be able to fire them because sometimes it doesn't work out, and that's one of the hardest things you're ever going to have to do is hire and fire. Hiring is usually pretty easy, but firing is really tough. This is, this is great. So let, we, let's break this down a little bit. You mentioned, you know, let's come back to the team, but you mentioned you got to find a real opportunity, one that's big enough. Do you have any suggestions about how you do that? Because I know it's easy, you know, you, I've seen this in my own self and I talk to entrepreneurs, you say, oh, this is a big opportunity, you know, people really want this, and in reality, that's something that over time you've fallen in love with the idea and, and the opportunity is not really out there. So how do you suggest you find a real opportunity? How, well, do you, how do you go about that? The process I go through is I, I ask questions again. Uh -huh. I go to who I think potential customers are and I say, There's, here's a good or service that I'm thinking about providing. What do you think about that? Is that something you'd buy? 
And sometimes if their friends are going to just, you know, to appease you because they know you're a wild, crazy entrepreneur, they're going to say, oh, yeah, I'd buy one. And then you say, this is a great test. Great, I'm taking pre-orders. I think it's going to cost $99.95. Pre-orders get it for $49.95, and I'll get you the first one as soon as it comes off the, the assembly line. Yeah. And then you'll find out if they really think it's a good idea because then they'll either give you a pre-order or they'll yeah. say, you know what, I think I'll pass. And so that's yeah. a good way to find out. That's kind of an acid test there. The other thing that you guys have that is a huge, powerful tool is the Internet. You can search a ton of things on the Internet to find out how much need is there out there and what are people asking for and what, is, what does the world look like. And mm -hmm. so those are some of the things that I use. Yeah, I like that, asking your customers. And you did highlight this part about be a little careful of family and friends because you know, they have a vested interest in not hurting your feelings. Yeah, they do. But, but then when you put a, a price tag on it, suddenly it becomes a little more real. So like a real test with customers mm -hmm. is great. Um, that's wonderful. Now let's jump back to the team. You were talking about some wonderful things about the team. Team complementarity, you know, like hire somebody who's different than you. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And yet hire somebody you can fire. Why, why, do you have to, why do you have to be able to fire someone? Well, Wouldn't, I mean, <laughs> don't you well, just hire the right person and it always works <laughs> out? Isn't that how it No, works? unfortunately yeah. not. You don't really see people's true colors until about 90 days later. Mm. And you don't know how they're going to fit in your culture. You don't know how they're going to be as far as their work ethic. It, it's hard to know. Yeah. And, for example, I had the experience of hiring some people in my ward, for example, mm -hmm. and one of them I was helping a, a family out and mm -hmm. thought I was really helping out by hiring their, their son. Mm -hmm. And if they're watching this program, they're going to maybe remember this. Yeah. <laughs> but I hired their son, and within two weeks, he was falling asleep on the job. Ooh. Yeah. And, of course, we had a supervisor talk to him, explain to him that we hired him to work, not to sleep. Yeah. And it happened again a few weeks later. And so after three times, three strikes, we had to fire him. Yeah. And that's really tough when it's your neighbor that says, why would you fire my son? It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, that is tough. So you know, got to be kind of have the guts to to move people out. I know that's an important theme I've heard before, which is, you know, the yeah. wrong person can really kind of drag an organization down quickly. Yeah. And then, but then there's this element of the right person. How do you find the right person? I'm so glad you asked that yeah. <laughs> because we're usually really quick to hire someone because we have this pain level. You're working 14 hours a day, five days a week. Your wife or your spouse is going. I never see you. I need to see you, and you go, okay, I've got a need now. I have a need. i got to hire somebody. Yeah. And you go out and you hire somebody fast, okay? So rule of thumb, be slow to hire. Take your time. Interview. Include your team. If you have a three- or four-person team, have everybody interview them. Don't just think you know it all and you know the right person. Include your team in the process of finding, selecting, interviewing. Calling references is a really good thing. Ask them a little bit about how this person works, how they interact with the team, those kind of things. And then... Be really quick to fire. I hate to say that, but when yeah. you know you have the right, the wrong person on the mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. and they're not working out, then you just need to you need to fire them quickly. Yeah. And usually we're, we're totally the other way around. We're very quick to hire and really slow to fire because it's not comfortable. It it hurts. It's not easy to do. Yeah, it's interesting. That really matches our what you've highlighted our natural biases. You know, mm -hmm. you want to hire fast because I mean, who wants when you're so busy? Who wants to spend half a day interviewing? You know, you, you're, you're naturally inclined to look at somebody and say, yeah, they'll work. They're a great fit, when really you should kind of be a little more careful. And then on the other end of it, we're really naturally inclined to kind of keep giving them more tries. Yeah, give them a chance. I don't want to have to face this conversation. So yep. that's great. What, do you have other kind of general rules of entrepreneurship that you have for us? Yes, I do. In the, the main success areas of a business, as you're growing your business, you have really main things. And there's five areas I believe that you really need to think about. And that is, one's marketing and sales. You have to have that one or you don't have a business. Second of all, you have to have operations, a way to get goods and services to your customers. That's an incredible thing that you have to have. Another one is, is finance. You have to have a way of financing your business, okay? And you got to have cash flow coming and going. And that all has to be working. And the other thing you have to have is human relations, or what we've been talking about, working with good employees. And the other part is research and development, R&D, is really important because you've got to constantly be finding out, what do my customers want? What do they need? And how do I provide that for them? And I call it the research and development. My understanding, Microsoft, as we know, is a super successful company, and they spend billions of dollars on R&D mm -hmm. just to make their thing keep moving. Yeah. So how do you, you know, in the early stages of a company, how do you fill out all those roles. Do you worry about those all at once or, or is that more of a later stage thing where you kind of try to have all of these areas? What do you worry about early on? 
Early on, I was worried about my first customer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's my, my biggest concern because if you don't have a customer, you don't have a business. Yeah. And so how do I get my first customer? What's, do I need to market to them? Do I direct sell by calling them? How do I get that first sell? To me, that's the most crucial part. And then after you get the sell, okay, now I got to deliver, right? Yeah. So simple in the garbage business is it was knocking on doors. Oh, you want me to hire garbage? Fantastic. Yeah. I'll be around on Saturday. And now Saturday I'm going to be around. I don't have a garbage truck. I need a garbage truck. Yeah. So now <laughs> operations kicks in. I got to yeah. find a way to go provide the service. Yeah. So then I go and borrow my dad's truck and a friend's trailer and I make my first garbage truck. Yeah. That's the simple part of it. Yeah. And then after that, oh, now I got to do billing. I got to somehow get paid so I can pay for the gas and the dump fees. Yeah. And so that's just, you kind of deal with it as it comes. But I always start with the customer. Can I get that customer in place, get that first sell under my belt and know I'm moving forward? You know, that's a great point. You know, there's, it's really important. I think often startups say, you know, the first stage for me is to create this really great product or this mm -hmm. really great service. And they, they go through all this effort and they, you know, they may spend six months to a year like kind of getting the product right. And they say, well, now I'm done. Why don't I go sell this thing? And they go out there and suddenly it's hard to find a customer. And I think, you know, the, the real emphasis early on should be exactly as you said, finding the customer and then, you know, in cases where it's a simple product like, a, you know, a garbage pickup service, you know, there's, there's not as much R&D and product development yeah. going on there. But when there is a lot of R&D and product development going on, it probably needs to happen pretty iteratively with that first customer. I mean, moving forward and really focused on a sale. Because if you don't have sales, you don't have anything. You really don't. That you don't. is so yeah. true. If I can just emphasize that again, yeah. you got to have a customer. Yeah, if you don't have sales, you don't have anything. You've got a product that you put a lot of money into that's just sitting there, and so you're in trouble. Yeah, there's fact I've heard there's millions and millions of patents on products that have never sold. Yeah. They get all excited, they make a product, they go through the patent process, spend thousands of dollars on that, and then the customer didn't want it. Yeah, it's <laughs> fascinating. And, Big and small companies do this alike. Well, what other words of advice would you have for you know budding entrepreneurs? You know, you've covered these core rules. You've covered you know the importance of having you know different areas of the organization functional and operational. What other things, advice would you provide to these students? And even specifically BYU students or members of the church or you know kind of the unique audience that we have. Spend some time getting educated would be the other thing I would say. I hope that all of you that are interested in starting your own business are taking entrepreneur classes here at school. I marvel that the medical industry and the dental industry put doctors through eight to ten years of school and then they go out and start a practice and they've never had one class on how to run a business. Mm. It just blows me away that it, that happens, but yeah. it does. I was just talking to a chiropractor, he got out of school and had zero education on business. So please get educated. There's a great book called The E-Myth. I know some classes require it. You have to read it. Read that book on the E-Myth, it stands for Entrepreneur Myth, and it's a great book to get educated on. Talk to some entrepreneurs, talk to people, ask your parents who they know that runs their own businesses. Keep being educated on business. Get some good trade journals, some good magazines. That would be another big thing, is to get educated on how to become an entrepreneur. Just don't jump into it and say, I'm going to do it. The other thing is, is consider partners. That's, mm, that's something that yeah. a lot of people say, man, partners are terrible. I would never have another partner. And I've had challenges with partners and it's not been easy, but I've had more successes with partners than I've had failures because partners, if you get the right ones, complement you. Yeah. And so be identifying potential partners that will help you in your quest of your business. Hmm. That's f um, Partners, wow. I, well, any advice for partners? I mean, in finding partners, keeping partners, I mean, I've heard advice like don't partner with friends, other people, maybe that's great, you know, but. But there is, does seem to be this element of it's hard to go alone. So what's your you know, lessons on partners? Lessons on partners are similar to employees. You, you need to get somebody that compliments you as a partner. Mm -hmm. Somebody that brings something to the table. On Keystone Learning Systems, for example, my partner was the video production person. He knew how to make videos and make it look nice and build sets and all those kind of things. And so it made sense for me to partner with him because I had no clue how to do all of that. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't afford somebody to go hire to do that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And so he did that part and then I did the marketing, sales, the operations, mm -hmm. and he was handling all the production side of it. Yeah. So that was one of the things I looked for. And then we really didn't have a lot of common interest because he was a artsy film kind of guy. and. I was a, a business country guy, and so it wasn't like we went golfing all the time together, yeah. but we had a common interest of creating a neat company, 
building it and growing it and providing for our family. So how did you even get hooked up with that guy? How did you? Well, it's so interesting that the, the software company I was working for, yeah. they were wanting to produce, I talked them into producing a demo video mm -hmm. of how our software works so we could increase our sales. And my manager ended up hiring this video guy. Mm -hmm. He was a um, independent producer and they hired him and then put me together with him to create our demo video for our software company. Mm -hmm. And we did that and he and I got talking and had some common ideas of the training world and we got wow. together. Great. <laughs> so you found, you know, you find folks in interesting places. I you think, really sometimes. do. You yeah. just need to be watching and looking. Yeah. I'm always watching and looking for good employees. If I go to a restaurant yeah. and somebody serves me really well there and takes really good care of me, I'm thinking, wow, that might be a really good customer service rep. Mm. I'd consider seeing if I can hire that person for my company or just interactions you have. I'm always looking. I'm yeah. Fascinating. So in summary, kind of some of your rules of entrepreneurship were find something you really are passionate about. And really underneath that was really understand yourself and be continually learning and asking questions so you know where you fit and what a good fit is for you. Second was find a good opportunity. And a good opportunity is one where there's real pain and it's big. You know, you're not just wasting your time. I've often heard people say, it takes the same, about the same amount of time to work on a small problem as a big problem, so pick a big problem. <laughs> um, I think that's really important. Third was the importance of the team. And you were talking about hiring in uh, people with complementary skills, taking time and hiring those folks, getting the right people, and then being quick to fire if, if things went wrong. Uh, fourth, you mentioned building out a really robust organization, you know, one where each of these core areas are filled out. And then we talked about kind of words of wisdom on life and, you know, an, an entrepreneurial life. Maybe it would be nice to see where, what we've missed. Let's ask the audience and the students, what, what questions do you have for Clint? Yes. What about your bank uh, was, or what do you, what did you find out about your bank that you felt like was missing in the banking industry? What was uh, the niche that you thought you needed? Very to good know? question. The three areas that we felt like there was a good opportunity. This is because of connections and potential customers that my friend knew that had a need, and so that, that need was SBA um, commercial lending, or sorry, real estate lending and the leasing lending. So he knew that there was a need because of his other business affiliates that he had seen there's a need out there. And it wasn't being completely filled by competing banks. And so he said, we can put this together and I know we can make it work. And so then I started doing the research on my own. There's online, you can go to FDIC.gov. You can look at all the banks' financial information. You can get a good feel for which banks are successful, which ones are mediumly successful, which ones are barely getting by. And, so I did my homework on it and realized, yeah, here's, here's an opportunity. Great question. What other yeah. questions? Yes. Well, some of the, you said that you worked for a couple of companies. How did you know when to leave and like, when to sell? <laughs> you know, that, like, well, why don't you stick with the garbage company and why, why don't you do that to this day? Can I tell you one of the funnest things is the country, the country garbage business, is what it was called, is still running today. That is so fulfilling for me. 20 years later, it's still a viable business. That's really fun. The reason I got out of it is it was very dirty and very physical. And I, it, I just decided this isn't something I want to do for a career, but it helped me get through college and it was, it was great. And so I didn't want to be in the dirt on that one. Um, what was the other part of the question? And you also worked for another company after the garbage? Yes, and how do you know when to jump? Um, for me, there's different ways to start a business. You can either borrow money from all your friends. Oh, here's another rule of thumb for me. is it plan, plan on taking about a year to really get going. Some entrepreneurs say six months to really get going. I say about a year. And then it takes you three to five years to really have a business that's rocking and rolling and that you can harvest. At least that's been my experience. I'm just, by the way, everything I'm sharing is from my experience, of course. But as I started getting Keystone going, what I did is I took the money that we had from the sale of, and I say we, meaning Sherry and I, my wife, and took the money from the sale of the garbage business and put it towards Keystone Learning Systems. I was still working for the software company doing sales during the day. I had graduated from college, so now I had a bunch of free time, right? I have now nights and weekends in between, gar or garbage now was sold. So I had nights and weekends to work on my business. And so we were working on Keystone to start it, nights and weekends still running the or working inside the software company 
the day I knew it was time to jump was when I went to my boss and said, I want to tell you, I've started my own company. I've been working nights and weekends. My wife answers the phones during the day. In fact, that's a funny story. Where my wife's taking phone calls at the house, taking orders, and she'd have to run and cl close the door, and our little three-year-old would be knocking on the door, Mom, Mom, and she'd be answering the phone, and the customers would be going, what's in the background? She goes, oh, I'm sorry, I had to work from home today. <laughs> and she, she would take the order and stuff. But anyway, when we started getting enough cash flow coming in after sales, um, we started saying, you know what, we, we need to jump. And that was a scary, scary day because I had this good sales job. I was making commissions. I got a check every two weeks. You know, it was security, right? And it was tough. That really scared Sherry a lot, making this jump to we're going to full-time our own business. But when we had the cash flow going, we had the customers come, and I felt it was time to jump. And that's how we financed it, started it, and we had no debt, and we kept funding our business from our profits. That's great. You know, it's, you brought up some great points there that I think are important for all entrepreneurs. I mean, first off, you've obviously been... Uh, very resourceful in starting your business, you know. Your wife was answering the phones from home, you know, and, and you know, you're keeping that burn rate really low on, yeah. on your expenses. But the other thing is you're kind of pursuing things in parallel. And um, it's important, I, I think, to, you know, sometimes we have a big idea. It's dangerous to just say, well, I'm going to quit today. I'm going to start mm -hmm. developing this now. And you want to give yourself runway. You want to give yourself time to develop a business. That's why school is often a good time to do it. Many MBA students I know often take their MBA to develop that business idea they had. Or you work on it nights and weekends. And this is advice not just for entrepreneurs. I've often heard it repeated for anybody who has a dream about something they want to do. They want to become a painter or something. Mm -hmm. Well, don't quit your day job. No. In fact, <laughs> one of my favorite authors, he worked for a long time running his own business and he would work only at night from like 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Now that seemed really difficult to me, but he kept doing it, and now he's one of Japan's most famous authors. But he didn't just jump off the ship and say, I'm diving into this wholeheartedly yeah. now. You kind of, you got to recognize that, you know, you, you have to pay for life, and those things take money. What other questions do you guys have? Yes. Going back to the bank, uh, what's the hardest part about starting a bank and then also kind of if you can go into maybe the capital requirements that the FDIC is looking for? Well, I'll give you three hard things about starting a bank. One, one isn't enough. <laughs> uh, one is, is understanding there's regulations in the banking industry. Um, I give this example to people all the time that if you want to start at a company today, you can start an LLC in a few hours. You can be up and running in a few hours. It took us 18 months to get the bank started because we have to go through regulatory approval, you have to put the business plan, do studies, and et cetera. So the regulations are a really tough part of getting in the banking industry. Uh, capital is a big issue of getting in the banking industry. When we started, you have to have a mil minimum of $5 million to start a bank in Utah, and it depends on the location as well. Now I understand the minimum is $10 million of capital to start a bank. That's another uh, hurdle for some starting entrepreneurs. Another challenge with bank is, is they do require, the, the regulations require that you have experienced management team to run the bank. So you have to hire somebody from another bank that's the president and CEO, has a great salary, benefits, um, accumulated vacation, et cetera, et cetera. You have to hire that person away and say, we have a startup bank and we're going to be great and awesome and you've got to talk them into coming to your bank to be part of that. And so that's a real challenge. That's fascinating. Other questions? Yes. Okay. Um, you talked a lot about um, the importance of creating a culture for your business. And as you're mm -hmm. starting it up and you're creating that culture, what do you base the criteria on? Do you try to suit the culture more to your employees or do you suit it more to your customers? I would say you ought to do both because you've, number one is your customers, right? There's four most value sets in a business, in my opinion. Your four most valuable. First is your customers, is your customers are the ones that pay the bills, right? You have to have a customer. Second of all is your employees, because employees take care of customers, day in and day out. Third is suppliers, because suppliers take care of both employees and customers, depending on who the supplier is. And then the fourth most valuable asset is yourself as the entrepreneur, because you're the one that has the dream, the drive, the one that keeps it all going. But those are the four main ones that I'm, I'm aware of or that I believe are the top ones. And so as you're developing that culture, it needs to be a culture of how do I take care of customers and what's the best way of doing that and then how do I make my culture enjoyable and great for the, the employees who are taking care of my customers. So that's how I would look at it. It's got to be both. Great question. I saw another hand over here. Yes. 
Um, you've talked a little bit about financing, and obviously your earlier businesses were more service-oriented businesses, and with the bank it's kind of capital-intensive. Intensive. What are maybe some caveats or some uh, red flags or, or concerns that we should consider uh, if we're looking to start a business that's more capital-intensive? Some of the concerns is going to be control that I would be way concerned about because you do want to make sure you have control of your destiny as an entrepreneur. I mean, if you want to go work for somebody, you get to have them be in the driver's seat, right? If you're going to start a business and you're going to end up working for someone, you're not any further ahead. You're taking a lot of risk without having all the great rewards that come with it. So I'd be careful about how much capital you bring in and who controls the capital and how that's all going to end in five years from now or ten years from now. And What's the expectations of that? So I'd, just, I'd be careful on how much money you raise as you go through the process. That's great. Thank you, Clint. It's been wonderful having you. It's been great to hear your experiences and your accumulated wisdom. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure being here. Thanks.